So you want to see where Jesus is found in the Old Testament? Look no further than Joseph's story, my friend, because he is a powerful picture of Christ. And here we're seeing Genesis 38, a lot of Bible teachers and pastors don't understand why Genesis 38 is there because Genesis 37 talks about Joseph and you can start to see how Joseph was a picture of Jesus. He was sold for silver uh, by Judah, which is where we get the name Judas. That's where his name derives from and sold for as a slave for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. That was also a price of a slave in his time. And so we're seeing that he was stripped of his tunic. It was dipped in blood. We're seeing this huge picture of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Genesis 38, it's like, what happened? Why are we talking about Judah? And he's sleeping with these and marrying these Canaanite women. Because, well, you're going to understand in this video, you're going to see why and how it ties in with Joseph's story and how he's a picture of Jesus Christ, how this is still Jesus' story. Watch this. It gets really good, you guys. I'm excited. Here we go. All right, so Joseph part five, the scepter departed from Judah, and that's key to this whole thing right there. Genesis 49, this is going ahead a bit here, but this is where Jacob or Yaakov, right? He was the father of the patriarchs of Israel, and he tells them, gather around, boys, I'm going to tell you what will become of you and your tribe, your lineage, each one of you, the 12 tribes. And he tells them each one, and he goes into Judah. And we know that Judah is the tribe where the Messiah comes from, right? And part of that, how we know, is right here. Genesis 49, it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah. This is Jacob prophesying over his sons. And here he is in Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That's what he said to his sons and especially to Judah. Until Shiloh comes? What does that mean? Who's Shiloh? Well, the term Shiloh was understood by the early rabbis and Talmudic authorities as referring to the Messiah, to Mashiach, right? That's who, what, who it referred to. That everybody knows that. This is what the ancient rabbis taught. So, after the death, here it is, guys, after the death of Herod in 4 BC, this is the son of Herod the Great, right? Herod Archelaus had been replaced over Judea as the end, end Tark, I'm not sure if I said that right, <laughs> sorry, I butchered that, by Caesar Augustus. So he was made in charge, he was made like the king in charge by Caesar Augustus. But then what happens he was broadly rejected, and he was removed in 6 to 7 AD. Now, let me ask you this. Who was alive during this time, 6 or 7 AD? Yes, Yeshua, Jesus. He was a boy, probably 8, maybe 7 or 8, 9 years old, there in Jerusalem, or there in Israel at this time. And they were visiting Jerusalem, by the way, too. We know that. But this is amazing stuff, you guys. So he was broadly rejected in 6, 7 AD. We know Jesus was alive. Now watch this. This is an amazing part of the whole thing. Here it is. Here it is, guys. Watch this. He was replaced by a Roman procurator named Caponius. And then what happens? The legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and the adjacent of capital cases or the adjudication, excuse me, of capital cases was lost. This is critical. So why is that important that the 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 legal power of the Sanhedrin to to take the capital cases and and have the judicial rights to capital punishment important because that's the fulfillment of that scripture that the scepter and the staff the ruling staff has departed from Judah but Shiloh, they thought, had not yet come. You're about to see that. Watch this, you guys. This is po really powerful stuff. Here it is. Okay, so this transfer of power is mentioned in the Talmud and by Josephus, right? The historian that was, uh, he worked for the Romans, the Jewish historian Josephus, which are documents from Jesus' time. So here it is, guys. So when the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their right uh, their their right over life and death, right? Capital punishment was taken away. They covered their heads with ashes and their bodies with sackcloth. Wow. And what did they do? They actually, they actually thought that the Torah, 
The word of God had failed them, had failed. No, it hadn't failed. Why? Because Yeshua, Jesus, was a young man there in Jerusalem. And as they were in sackcloth and ashes, and they were weeping in the streets, saying that the scepter has departed from Judah, but Shiloh had not yet come. Jesus could have been looking at them and looked around the corner and said, that's not true. I have come, right? Wow. (laughs) So we know that that's what happened. The historical uh, records tell us, and let's continue on it. So the Sanhedrin cried out in Jerusalem. Here it is again, guys. The scepter departed from Judah, but Shiloh had not yet come. But, right? But Shiloh had come, my friend. Shiloh was there. The Messiah was there. That scripture was fulfilled. The scepter had departed from Judah, but Shiloh had come. He was there with them in in, in Israel and in Jerusalem when they visited there on their pilgrimage. So back to Joseph's story. How does it relate to Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 38? Joseph really isn't even mentioned in Genesis 38, but what do we see? So the previous chapter, we saw this. We saw that he was stripped of his tunic. Those brothers conspired to murder him, and they sold him for pieces of silver. And then we see this. He, that is Judah, said, what pledge shall I give you? So he's speaking to this woman, right, who uh, was supposed to marry one of his sons, Tamar, and he's saying, well, what can I give you as a pledge to, so that you, I promise you that you know, you'll get this goat, which is like payment for the prostitution that, that he thought he was doing. And then it says, and she said, your seal and your cord, okay, now watch this, a seal or a signet would, would be, have been used to stamp his identity on documents. This is like super important stuff. Remember, Joseph gives the signet ring, which is like having all the power and authority. So this is like Judah's power and his authority. So Judah likely carried such an object on a necklace or on another cord. And that's what he gave up to Tamar here in Genesis 38. And your staff that is in your hand. Now it gets a little more interesting. The staff that was in his hand. Okay, so Judah gave up his staff. Why is that a big deal? Remember Genesis 49 where Jacob was prophesying over Judah? He says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes or until the Messiah comes. So we're seeing a picture of this in Joseph's story, you guys. This is amazing because what happened? He, he had left them. He was going to go off into the Gentile land now, right? He was handed over to the Gentiles, and there's that huge picture of the cross, right? And then he's over in the Gentile land, separated from Israel. So Shiloh had come. Israel just didn't know it. They didn't realize it. And this is what the temple looked like during that time, the time of Herod, right? And here you could see a bunch of priests. They're praising God and a bunch of Israelis behind them. And here's the the altar. And what happened when Jesus died on that cross? Matthew records it was a great earthquake where rocks were split in two. And you could look at even in geography, they said there was a huge, huge earthquake that went up the African Rift Valley, that, that fault line that goes all the way up through the Red Sea and then the Dead Sea. And there's a splinter fault that goes right through Jerusalem, through the Mount of Olives and down into Jerusalem when Jesus died. And what happened? The veil, the massive veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And what did this veil do? It separated the holy place to the holy of holies, the holiest place where the ark was, which had the mercy seat, which is where the Lord sat. And it was that place that was sprinkled with blood. Wow. (laughs) So this man here, this evil man, uh, Titus, who was the general at that time, around 70 or 67 AD to 70 AD, this is after Jesus had been resurrected, and there was a church in Jerusalem, and the churches were starting to spread throughout the whole world. And this guy came down from Galilee, and they they went into uh, the temple area in Jerusalem. It was a horrible time because they burned the temple, and they killed thousands of Jewish people. It was recorded by Josephus. So this is what was going on during this time. 
Uh, and that's around 70 AD. The temple was destroyed. Here's a painting of it here. And then what do we see here? This is an archway that you could still see in Rome today. This is called the Archway for Titus of Titus. And it was built for him to commemorate what he did in 70 AD when he destroyed the Jewish temple. So here's a menorah. This is what it actually probably looked like, the golden lampstand, the seven gold lampstand that was in the holy place of the temple. And by the way, the Jewish people have rebuilt this. You could see this in Jerusalem today. There's one there ready for their third temple. This is amazing stuff, right? And here's the table of showbread. And you could see this in the archway as these are Romans carrying it as they celebrated their victory in Jerusalem. So, and it was a sad day for the Jewish people though. But Genesis 38, it's amazing how this connects with Jesus' story and with Joseph. It's amazing. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. So he's, he's out uh, having relations with these women who are not the, the women that were approved, that the women that uh, his father would approve, right? And he was away from his brothers, it said. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. They were not supposed to be having relations with these Canaanite people. And he took her as a wife and had relations with her. And now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. So Tamar enters into the picture right here. And she is the great, 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 great grandmother of King David, who was also the great, 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 great grandmother of the Messiah Jesus because he was born of Mary or Miriam if you're in Israel. So here we are in Genesis 38. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Now this kind of looks like the picture to me of the early church in Jerusalem. Remember, um, Ananias and Sapphira, they were, they, they were the Christians that were with this church, the believers, but yet they lied. They lied to Peter, and they actually lied to the Holy Spirit, and they just fell over dead about how they were going to pledge like way more money than that they actually did. And it doesn't mean they didn't go to heaven, because if they didn't go to heaven, none of us have hope to go to heaven. But God was making it a point because he had this pure church that was just starting up, this, this movement this, of his church, and he wanted to keep it pure. And uh, I believe that's my conjecture on it. And so he took their lives when they lied about, you know, we didn't want to see the corruption come into the church that early like that. It did come in a lot later. It still is there today. But anyway, so let's get back into this. So, so Ur was, uh, the Lord took his life. And when Judah saw her, so we're skipping ahead to verse 15 here. He's talking about, this is about Tamar now. He assumed that she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. So she dressed up like a prostitute and Judah saw her and he wanted to sleep with her, right? So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me have relations with you. So he was just straight up saying, you know, I want to have sex with you basically. And for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She was in disguise, right? She, he didn't know this. And now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, right? Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has prostituted herself. And behold, she is also pregnant by prostitution. Uh-oh. So what does Judah say? Then Judah said, bring her out and have her burned. Whoa, 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 whoa. Easy, dude. Bring her out and have her burned? Oh, my goodness. She also said, please. So she, she, her response to this was to, to Judah, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. She had those sent out ahead. Very wise woman. <laughs> and she says to Judah, who, who do these belong to? And then bingo, right? The light bulb goes off. Judah realizes he had sinned, right? That it was him. I am pregnant by the man whom these things belong, the signet, the cord, and the staff, right? So uh, here in verse 26, it says, And Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I. So he's starting to feel a little bit of good conviction right there. He's starting to change a little bit, right? 
since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, right? Because he was afraid that Sheila would die also like the other sons. So let's look here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, in the genealogy record of Jesus. And here it says, uh, and it's through Joseph's line first, and you know Joseph was just his stepfather, not by blood, because uh, Miriam, or Mary, she was by the full blood with Jesus because she was through the tri- tribe of Judah, just like Joseph was, but she was through the line of Nathan. Very important that we understand that. So Matthew 1, 3 says, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. So she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? It's kind of like Ruth, right? Ruth is in there too, and and uh, it's just amazing. So Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram. So it continues on there all the way down. And Perez is an ancestor of Jesus the Messiah. Wow. <laughs> So the son of Tamar is in that line, and she is too. So Matthew chapter 1 continues here at the near the end of this genealogy record through Joseph. It says, Jacob fathered Joseph. So Joseph, who married Mary, right, had a father named Jacob. Why did God do that? I think God did that to show us that there's Joseph was a big picture of Jesus. He's in this genealogy right here. It says, Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. I love reading that. Isn't that beautiful, you guys? So good. So God took Perez, the son of his ungodly situation, and he put him in the family line of the Messiah. This is amazing. So despite the fact that neither Judah nor Tamar were examples of godliness, what is it? This is a beautiful example of God's grace. That's what it is. Because you and me, we don't deserve having salvation either. But God's grace, giving us something good that we don't deserve, gives it to us anyway, and he forgives us. But first, you have to come to him and you have to ask for forgiveness. So God chose them despite their works, both to both be in the line of the Messiah, because both of them did wrong in that, in that uh, Genesis 38, both of them, Tamar and Judah, both. So now back to the story of Joseph, right? So what's going on with Joseph? So the scepter departed from Judah, That's what we see in in this part of the story. And the same thing happened when Jesus was a boy there in the land of Judah and in Israel. The scepter had departed from Judah and Shiloh had come. (laughs) It's not like he didn't come. He was there. So meanwhile, right? Meanwhile, here in Egypt, we see in this Gentile land, what do we see? We see this figure who's like, the Messiah, who is a foreshadowing of Jesus, living in this Gentile land right now, and it's going to be an amazing thing when we keep going in this. I can't wait. So Genesis 38 is an interruption, a pause in the story of Joseph as Israel was lied to, right? Remember, uh, a wild animal had devoured him, they said. It's kind of like how Psalm 22, verse 16 or 17 in the Jewish Bibles says that like a lion right? But it's really, they pierced my hands and my feet. And so he believes his favored son is dead, and Judah departs. Judah departs. And here's an image of the Shroud of Turin here, and they found that there was actual blood right here where the crown of thorns was. This is probably what Jesus looked like, and this is what he looked like after he was buried and he was dead. But that's not the end of the story, you guys, because, but, (laughs) he is not dead, right? He's not dead. He is alive. He lives. Jesus lives, my friend. This is great news. This is why us Christians are so excited about it, because we know we will live too, and our Savior lives. Our Redeemer lives. He's alive. He is not dead. He lives. My Redeemer lives. I love that. Don't you? It's beautiful. It's awesome. All right, my friend. So look at that one more time. I just love it. (laughs) The stone was rolled away that early morning and Jesus was raised 
from the dead. Hey, if you don't believe in Jesus, you can say a prayer and receive him and believe in him and be born again as a new creature If you've never given your life to Jesus, you can do that right now, my friend. He's only a prayer away. And you would be you speaking to God, not to anybody else. So just stop what you're doing. If you'd like to do that right now and say this prayer and say these words after me as you're praying from your heart to God. Are you ready? Let's pray. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. I choose to turn from my sin and follow you. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that in three days you're raised from the dead and you're alive today. And I choose to follow you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, my friend, amen. If you did that, Get connected with a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church and make sure you're getting fellowship with other believers. Make sure you're praying every day, reading your Bible, and just the main thing is having that relationship. Those things will help you have that relationship with Jesus. All right, and don't forget to hit this playlist right here, How to Find Jesus in the Old Testament. You're going to see all the previous episodes, and I believe it will bless you, my friend. I love you guys. God bless you. See you next time.